Okay. So let's begin. Welcome to everybody who's uh, joining me on uh, Facebook and uh, the people that will be joining me on the podcast. This will be broadcast on my podcast along with two other pieces. I haven't talked talk to Father uh, Nathan about this yet, but uh, I'll give you a little background on why this interview is taking place now. Uh, the first two parts of this are actually done. It goes back to, um, I started back in the 1970s and my main interest back then when I ended up in the, um, the tornado and ended up, realized I was no longer in Kansas is um, I was interested in death. I did a study when I, when I was at university on um, all the weird things that happen around death. And anyway, so this goes on and I ran into uh, Father Nathan's work and was absolutely fascinated in, in what he was doing uh, listen to everything I, he has done that I can get a hold of, all his podcasts. He runs a, a, a podcast, and it's called, and of course, I've got the, give me it to give me, Father Nathan. Your, your podcast is? It's called The Joyful Friar. Jo Joyful Friar. And you've, you've just started this recently, and you uh, go through some of your stuff and, uh, that you're doing. You've got um, a number of books, Helping Stuck Souls Crossover, book one and book two, which I've read. Mm -hmm. And you uh, did a book on the Wizard of Oz, which is uh, fascinating me, and Toto too, uh, the Wizard of Oz as a spiritual adventure. And you've and already I, made an Oz, Oz reference already in the first minute of this uh, broadcast. Pardon me. You mentioned a tornado in Kansas right at the very beginning yeah. today. And and I had I had my experience. I wrote a book called Inspired, where I actually looked at um, inspired books. And uh, you you've been in contact with uh, Gene Houston out mm -hmm. of New York, and she talks about the fact that she was contacted by the author of The Wizard of Oz's granddaughter, and that um, the granddaughter had said this was uh, a, a download experience, that, that all this sort of right. came instantaneously. And there are a number of books that have come this way. Uh, the, all the Harry Potter books uh, came this way to J.K. Rawlings on a, on a delayed train going into, Man into London from Manchester, um, the um, 12 Steps, 12 Traditions, uh, the uh, the uh, person who was key, one of the two key people, talked to, to his priest about the fact that he had gotten help from a 15th century monk to write this book. And you get these. So I've, I've written about this quite a bit about this download process, which I have actually experienced myself. But what caused me to do this interview, because uh, I planned this quite a while ago, is a friend of mine, uh, Enrique Villanueva who um, I actually wrote a book on him. He, I, I won't get into, he's, he's, uh, he runs a, uh, an event once a year up on Mount Shasta on the, on the sand flats. And um, I wrote a book uh, on one weekend that I spent with him and his group. And just in the last little while, he was suddenly uh, being interviewed and he started telling this story about being pulled. Um, he was in LA and he suddenly gets pulled to a crash and he there's this crash of a plane and he's there to help people go over to the other side and and he goes through all these people and i'm thinking like wow i mean i had put off this interview with uh, the, uh father nathan and then i thought man i gotta do this and then he added to the thing the whole thing about uh, his group that he has um, he had an experience with archangel michael with 50 people and these various events that happened and i thought Wow, man! I, I, it looks like the clue is uh, is in there to get me to do this interview. So, welcome, uh, Father Nathan, and I really appreciate all the work you've done. And um, I, I'm just fascinated to go through your story and to share your story with other people because I think it's very important. There's, I, I have a number of people. I talked about Michael Newton. I talk about uh, Paul Selleck. There's people that I will talk about that people will hear. Uh, and I talk about them repeatedly. I watch everything they do. And they're sort of like key people that have sort of come into my life and have sort of helped direct what I'm doing. So your stuff is very important. And uh, maybe you can sort of introduce uh, how this started for you. Uh, and I want to go back to one interview you were talking about when you were a child, uh, you were praying, you were learning how to pray. And I think you mentioned that this may have had something to do with how this sort of unfolded in, in your life. So maybe go through the story of how this starts, the, the, uh, the, um, the gentleman that, that you encounter and this very sort of bizarre story of, of this turn in your life and how you become this sort of um, 
person to put out this very key message about um, existence and death and, and, and what's really going on, where we're coming from, where we're going, and why are we here on earth? Sure. Well, for your audience, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a Catholic priest. I'm a Dominican. Um, I've been a priest for almost 38 years and a Dominican for 42. The, uh, there's a, we're in the Lent season right now. We're in the fourth week. Easter's coming up on the 9th of April. And there's a phrase called the Easter Proclamation, which is the church's message in one sentence. He is risen. Or another way of saying it is Jesus is risen from the dead. So the idea about the survivability of death, and it's not just about the person of Jesus, but he's the template, the model, showing the rest of us uh, our own nature. That's has been something I was raised with from day one. So that was part of my training. But I think you're referring to the way that my um, my family, especially my mother, taught me to pray as a really small kid, maybe three, four years old, uh, that I had a family on earth and a family in heaven, that I was something of a hybrid being. She wouldn't have used that word, but that I had a, a mortal nature and an immortal nature at the same time, but in different ways. Uh, one of the things that she taught me to do was to repeat after her when I was too small to form my own prayer sentences and so on. We would give blessings to people. Uh, and it didn't matter whether they were in the house with you in the next state over where my cousins lived or even people who had already died because God was everywhere with everyone always. And God would always see that your blessing got where it needed to go kind of like sending a gift to somebody with your prayerful thoughts. Mm -hmm. And you didn't need to know what they did with it. Kind of like when you and I might give gift cards at Christmas or some other gift giving occasion, we don't necessarily track down the recipient and ask them what they spent it on. We, we give away a gift and hope that the people who receive it will use it in the way that is most fitting or joyful for them. So I was blessing people as a little kid. And what they did with the blessing, it was just an, it was some sort of energetic asset, some good that you could give. Um, I got very interested in praying for people when I was about six. I learned about the fact that some people, we, the way it was explained to me, there was a heaven, a hell, and a purgatory, and they were like uh, nation states with borders. One, two, and three. You went to you went to one of these or the other. And that most people weren't terrible and most people weren't perfect, but a lot of them landed somewhere in the middle in this place where there was still an opportunity for growth and change. And we could assist them from here by blessing them. So, um, and then one of my teachers, uh, both of my aunts were Dominican uh, nuns and they both taught first grade. So I also had that input and my grandmother, their mother lived next door and was a mystic. So it was just all over the place. And I learned that um, most most Christians who were not Catholic didn't believe in a purgatory, and so they didn't pray for their dead because they weren't taught to. So I would once I knew how to read the paper, I, I would I, we had a morning and an evening newspaper at the time, and both of them had a page of photos of people who had recently died. And in the '60s, nobody had a funeral that was not in a church. There were no celebrations of life in someone's backyard. They were always at a church. So I would I would read for any that weren't Catholic, and I would pray for them. I just thought, and then my dad took us, all uh, the five of us, to the bank one at a time with our college fund. We They started a college fund for each of us in the first week of our life, and regularly I'd be taken to the bank with my little passbook savings book, and he'd have to give it to the lady, and the number would get bigger, and dad would say, you see, the number's bigger, so by the time you get big enough to go to college, there'll be enough money to pay for it. But when you went to the bank, it's clear that they plan to make you wait. <laughs> there might be six uh, teller windows and three people working, but there was that zigzaggity series of velvet ropes or whatever that made you wait in an orderly way. Well, kids learn how to wait. Kids, you know, Parents never want to do things as quickly as kids do, uh, uh, but we learn how to wait and how to wait in an orderly way and be patient and know that your turn would come. But I got busy praying for the souls in purgatory that were at the end of the line. Uh, I was also told that if your prayer sprung somebody from purgatory to heaven, you would have a friend for all eternity. So that to me sounded like low hanging fruit. I started praying at night for anybody that was one prayer away from heaven. And 
I would imagine this line like at the bank and some poor guy or gal is one step away, one prayer away, aggravatingly close to heaven, but not yet in. And my prayer would push them over the line. And then the whole line would move up one and I'd pray for whoever just got there because it must be discouraging to find there's a long line in front of you. Nobody wants to see that. So I was in charge of Purgatory's prompt customer service. I just That was what I formed in my head as a little kid. And I did that every night falling asleep. Um, it sounds exhausting, but that's okay when you're trying to fall asleep anyway. I would just fall asleep exhaustedly at praying for the souls in purgatory. So that's a little background. Um, and then years and years later, in my early 40s, I was a priest. I was ordained at 29 years old, but I was on a retreat with some people. And I used to have to take a turn with a pager. Most priests have lived this in part of their life where if they're near a hospital, they're part of a rotation. And Tuesday night might be your pager night, where if there's a medical emergency that requires a priest in the middle of the night, you're it. And so on the nightstand, you might have a pager go off. Well, I was on this retreat, and I was having a dream about finishing a round of golf, going into the bar with my, another priest friend. We've stumbled into a silent auction, which is still my dreamscape because I've been a nonprofit leader most of my life. Silent auctions are one way that you raise money, donated items. There was a piece of nasty art on the far wall that uh, resembled what we would now have a, a, a flat screen TV. This was before we had televisions on walls, but it was against a far wall. I called my friend's attention to it and said, look at that horrid piece of art over there. It's just ghastly. Who would give that to a charity? But it was it had a quality about it that made me wanted to see it even more clearly the way that we might be ashamed, but we stop and go slowly by the wreck on the freeway because we just want to gaze at it. Um, well, anyway, it moved toward me. I moved toward it. And inside the frame was a picture of a young man in, engulfed in flames, dying on the radiator, the engine of a car. It was clear in the dream that he had not been an accident. It wasn't a wreck. But for some reason, he was sitting on the engine of a car and caught fire. So I I uh, prayed for him. Pardon me. I'm having some allergy issues today. Mm -hmm. um, we um, he he was screaming and uh, and he died that way apparently. And I I knew that it was not my dreamscape anymore. The golf part was, and the silent auction maybe, but not this burning man. So anyway, I, I uh, said a prayer for him. I went back to sleep. And in the morning, I got to, with a partner. I was giving a retreat. And there was a friend and prayer partner of mine was on the retreat. I knew that she had extraordinary spiritual gifts because we had prayed together before and they had manifested. Um, and so I asked her, would you mind praying with me about this guy? Something happened in the night. Well, it turned out that um, when we got still, maybe about two or three minutes into prayer, she said, whoever this man is, he really wants to talk to you. Would it be OK if I let him do so? And I knew that she had that capacity. So um, I said, well, we protected ourselves. You mentioned Michael the Archangel already. We we always use Michael and Holy Mary and a whole cadre of other uh, saint and angel friends to protect ourselves before we move into that realm. And out of it came uh, meeting Ray, who is, his story is told in full in the first of my two afterlife books. So uh, anybody who wants to find that story in full, it's really uh, easily available. And it's one of 400 stories, right? Did you, 400 plus that you've done now? Yeah, closer to 500 now. I didn't, at, in the early years, I didn't keep close track of them. But after a while, I began recording them on an app on my phone because they they happen out loud. So it's auditory. So I, I record them on an app. I get them transcribed into a Word document. And 26 of them have been told in public in two books. I have a third book in the pipeline right now. Um, but I have a lot of stories that are, have not been made public, and I don't make them public without going back and asking that person's permission to use their story. So we go back and do one follow up with them to say, hey, remember me? Uh, we helped you when you were doing that crossing. Would it be OK if we told your story out loud? And instead of getting yes or no answers to a yes or no question, we've often gotten little follow up uh, stories. Wow. Um, so, so go on with the story of Ray, but the, um, you mentioned this, this idea, and my question would be now is, 
are they part of this thing? So your sort of your mission or your um, and and telekey or whatever is that your this part of your mission is this part of their mission? Do the, do the people that you go and ask for permission from do they realize that they're actually contributing to the world? That they're part of giving a sort of a lesson to people about how things are working? They do. Ray's and getting and, pretty famous, I think. I mean, he's he must have told this story a hundred times. I have. Um, um, yes. Although when you have 26 people that have something in common, they're not all going to respond to it in the same way. So there's some of them that that are very actively a part of my uh, imagination and in my prayer life and so on. I refer to them as the book people, the 26 of them collectively. And I'll say, hey, book people, would you get over here? Uh, <laughs> but then there are some of them that um, that made it clear that they wanted to be very specifically remembered and actively engaged in this work. So uh, sometimes they come to mind and I call them individually by name, but they're all people that I look forward to knowing better when I pass and uh, I hope they'll be there to greet me. Ray, of course, uh, promised he would. He, I asked him at the end, he had, he, he, the, uh, the, the, I'm trying not to tell that story in detail because it has been told so many times and it's easily available, but he, he, we asked him, what is it you want? And he said, I, my wife, uh, I died when I was 20. We were only married a year and a half. I've been watching her ever since. She's dying of cancer. I want to greet her when she passes, but I can't the way I am. So we helped him figure out what that was. And uh, he was successful eventually in greeting her when she did die. And so I, I asked him at the end, I said, well, you, we know about you that you're, you know very well how to follow somebody and watch them. And you know how to pay attention to when they died and greet them. Now that we're friends of a sort, at least, would you watch me? And when it's my turn to die, would you be there to greet me? And he said, why, sir, I would be most honored. Just look for the perfect gentleman. I had I had told him I thought the reason that there was a problem was because he behaved like a caveman. He had an attitude about it. He was angry about the way he died. Um, and he he had a, an imagination that he was the only person uh, entitled to greet her. And I said, just chill out. She's <laughs> she's in her 60s. You're not the only person she ever loved. There might, might be a few of you that, but you certainly belong there. At least I would think you do. So anyway, that's the way it worked for him. Yeah. And and Ray brings up an important sort of issue that that I guess you deal with as a priest or people when when people talk about God is this issue that why did God do this to me? Like, like we're a victim. Yes. So can you yes. get into that, uh, expand on that a little bit? He more? had been taught that as a little child. And that's, we we asked him that. He said, who the hell does he think he is taking me just when my life was getting good? Well, I said, okay, let's start with basics. It sounds like you understand that there is a God. Yeah. Well, how did you know that? Well, my mom. Well, tell me about your mom and how she taught you about God. Well, she made me kneel next to my bed and she beat me while I prayed. Uh, why did she do that? I don't know. Well, would you have beaten your child? Uh, he had a, a child that was a year and a half old when he died. And I said, would you have done that if you had gotten to raise your child um, longer than you did? And he said, of course not. And I said, well, maybe you learned a thing or two about God that was just uh, not true. Did ever anybody ever say anything about you that they thought was true, but wasn't? That happens all the time. You know, uh, people die for all kinds of reasons. You don't have to blame God for the fact that you died in the fire. Anyway, he he was willing to change his thought a little bit on that topic. And and you you have you have him and and it goes to um, maybe you can elaborate on you you're involved with near death experience people yes. and stuff like that and a lot of people will bring up the the negative near death experience what do you take with that do we have responsibility for when we cross over how we build that world and and what happens to us in terms of because people always bring up the near death experience the bad one like okay so what was this all about I mean you have the good ones and you have the bad ones. And are, uh, how much do we influence? Because you you are able to switch these people around, which I think is the the bottom line to this whole story. Is these people come to you as you know victims and as people who are stuck, and you turn it all around, and and their their life, you know, goes a different direction. That's true to a point, but we're really at the tail end of a continuum of care. Since the of the people that come to me and to my prayer partners died suddenly and violently, yeah. all the ways that that can happen. Uh, not very many medical emergencies. Most of them are car crashes, shootings, stabbings, drownings, falls. Uh, but 
they they entered into they went from that event that caused the death of the body into a continuum of care where they got what they needed and then we're like the discharge staff at the end of that continuum the people that help you out the door when you don't need to be in the hospital any longer so yes we have a part to play but it's not all of it in fact they come into what they call my line um when they're deemed to be ready sometimes they have to wait a little bit like right now i have about 10 in the line uh, <laughs> so my prayer partners and i need to kind of get on the stick and get some more of these done but it takes time like everything else this isn't the only thing i do in a course of a day i'm i'm not full-time employed as a pastor like i used to be but i have mass to say tonight and i I might be the cook today. I have to go grocery shop or, you know, it's just not the only thing that I'm doing. But anyway, we, we take care of our people as, as promptly as we can. And, and you, in most of these cases, you have a, is there always a spirit guide involved that is sort of working, bringing them to you and working in between? Yeah, that's one of the most delightful parts of it for me. Uh, I, I, I use the language that I was equipped with as a Catholic Christian. And so I call them a guardian angel. Other people, you know, I'm a member of IAN, so I'm a, a, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm around lots of people with different cosmologies and language about how to speak of these things. I just call them guardian angels. And uh, that when they, when, when it's time for, they, they bring a dream, like last night I had two of them, and I wrote them down in my journal. Um, but then when we schedule, I think I have an appointment on Friday morning to do two of them. We usually can schedule for two hours at a time and do two crossings. They take less than an hour apiece normally. Uh, and we'll do those. But when um, there's something that we call a mic test, that when we're like you and I didn't need to do very much to launch this call today. Yeah. Uh, but I've been on other podcasts and stuff where we have a bunch of tech drills to run through before <laughs> we're ready to go live. And it's a little like that because this this human who is in this passage has probably never borrowed another human voice before. Yeah. So they're being asked to do something they've never done. Um, that always can make people a little uh, ill at ease. So we try to make that as gentle as possible. And the guardian angel will often go first and model it and say, see, it's really easy to do. And when they come on, they're not really giving a content filled message they really are doing a mic test can you hear me at the back of the room you know <laughs> it, it's just and th there's a little bit of chat uh and sometimes they're they're persons they're angelic persons they're not human persons but they're personal and so they can have the same variety of personality that human personalities can there can be some who are very uh, serious and task oriented there are others that want to be playful right out of the gate um they can be silly if they feel like it. They, but the ones, the way that it's played out for us is they usually pick a name for the occasion. So it's not necessarily like Michael the Archangel who's called that day in and day out. They choose some sort of a, a name by which they want to be called today, and they play with us. Uh, and and then they they're usually not on the line more than a minute or two before they say, "Okay, I think the one that I love and guard is ready to speak." So I'll slide to the side. And I'll be with you in prayer. Wow. Do you do you ever go to the spirit guides and try to get material from them or pick their brain? Because they're sort of a level higher. And I mean, I if you start study Michael Newton, he talks about this where he's he's dealing with these these guides and he he has these people at various color levels, whatever. And when he gets one at a very high level, he says, Can I talk to your spirit guide? And he tries to pick their brain. Do you ever try to uh, talk to <clears throat> the spirit guide and try to get get some understanding of of, of life and what's going I, on. I haven't. That doesn't mean I couldn't in the future, but mostly I've kind of stayed in my lane. I feel like I've been given this job to do and I try to be faithful to doing it. And the people that were helping, um I, I'm I'm very focused on them and their journey and not my curiosities or uh, yeah. research interests or anything like that. Doesn't mean that I couldn't do that some other time, I suppose, but I've really opted to just stay at the task that I've been given. Now, the question people might ask is, is isn't this the spirit guide's job? I mean, rather than coming to you, why can the spirit guide, like Ray was like, what, 1960 or something? Yes. Like why, people would ask, why is the spirit guide not doing this and talking to the person and 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 moving them into the light? Well, um, different philosophies 
cosmologies, religious dispositions might come at this from different points of view. But um, I believe that the creator of the universe created an interdependent universe. That uh, the creator obviously is, at least in my estimation, is is competent enough to do uh, everything on its own, on his own, um, but chooses to include us in co-creating. And uh, in, in, for example, in the Jesus tradition, there's six different times in the four gospels where there's a feeding of a multitude. It, those stories always start with scarcity, a large crowd, almost no food, uh, and then some moment where Jesus says, get them to sit down, or there is a kid here with five loaves and two fish. Okay, well, let's bless this. And then as soon as he's done blessing, he doesn't say, everybody out of the way, I'll take it from here. In fact, he says, uh, now you feed them. And then he gives his disciples the job of getting everybody fed and of collecting up all the leftovers. And I just feel like that's a pattern of the universe, that, that we're engaged in godly work not because God couldn't do it on his own or put somebody more important in charge of it. Uh, we're it a lot of the time. <laughs> We've been given a life with lots of things that we're capable of doing and we're, we're, uh, it's, a, it's a joy and an honor to do them. Now, um, let me think of the question I wanna ask here. Um, you, you mentioned, I think before that you started with one prayer partner that helped you. I wrote a book called Contact Modalities where I sort of talk about people like you that have the gift where whatever modality it is, where they can sort of get in and do whatever. And so yours you have, and your one died. And, and the thing that interested me was the, that with you, you had the talent, but then you bring in a prayer partner who can sort of do that. And then when that prayer partner dies, somebody else comes in and they can do it as well. I mean, is that, is that true that, that, that- Yes, I don't have only one prayer partner right now. I have about 10 or 12. And they um, could all do this? Yes, because it doesn't require anything of them other than compassionate listening. They just not, they don't need to bring people through. I do that. My sister's oh, both. Okay, you're same. doing that. Okay. Yeah, my, I do that. Or my sisters can both do the same thing. Um, I'm not always with them, but uh, the prayer partners really just need to be compassionate listeners who are not so in awe of the process as to um, make it creepy, you know? I, I don't need any kind of voyeuristic prayer partner that just wants to be there because it's so cool. They really need to be compassionate persons listening to another person's story and at a critical moment asking them, are they ready to make this crossing and who would they like to have accompany them? They're gonna need a guide of some kind because they're going to a place they've not been before. Have, 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 have they all succeeded? Have you succeeded with everyone or is there somewhere after you've talked about still not I think ready? One, one time when um, when nothing happened, when at the time that we said we were ready, and I, I don't know what that one, what that was all about. We just went on to the next. But out of like 500, yeah, they're pretty, they're they're all vetted. They don't get in my line on their own. Their guard, their guardian, their guide, or their team uh, sends them my way. And so they've already been pre-approved. They're ready. They don't need to be arm twisted, uh, persuaded. Yeah. They're really ready to go. Wow. And and one of the things that interests me, because I've seen this in other sort of modalities, is this the fact that that world is more plastic than this world. It's not as solid. It's not as physical. So can you tell the story of the one that impressed me was the conductor, where you have the conductor, oh, where you, you sort of set up a scenario for them. And then he goes, oh my goodness, it's like, it's like, it starts to happen. This, this idea that whatever it requires in that spirit world for them to make the transition, it can sort of just manifest and it, it goes, can, you can tell the story about the, the conductor. I'd be happy I, I, to. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that one up because I don't tell that story as often as I ought. Yeah, his, he, he only gave us the name Buddy because he had an attitude and he didn't really want to reveal his proper first name, but he used the word Buddy the way you might just refer to somebody a stranger as buddy hey buddy uh well anyway he had an attitude because he was angry and that one was my older sister Mimi I was in her backyard in suburban Houston when we helped him and she led him through so I was on I was on the receiving end I was the prayer partner and she was the one allowing him to speak and that I had I had seen in the dream that I had received was a succession of car train collisions can you remember a time uh when you had to sit and watch at, at a crossing watch a long train go by yeah yeah 
Yeah. Especially, you know, years ago, before there were as many overpasses as there are now, it used to be common that you'd get stuck behind a long train yeah. and you'd watch tank car, tank car, flat car, box car. Uh, but instead of it being car, 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 it was crash, 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 crash. And they were, they moved from older cars, like from the 20s up to the present. And, but the same thing was happening. Cars were being hit by trains. And I woke up from it and thought, well, this must be a cluster. Uh, but we went into prayer and just, I, I, I read the story uh, to my sister and we sat in prayer and he came through and uh, I don't remember what he said. Um, I'd have to go back to that one. Um, well, he was he was angry and and really only barely able to do the crossing that we were talking about. I, mean, I just finished saying you hardly ever have to twist their arm or anything. Well, in Buddy's case, it was pretty close to that. He had a real attitude and was angry and frustrated. And it seems that he had landed. He was in a car crash. Uh, he was not the driver. He and a buddy had been out drinking and or I think he said partying and uh, or having a joyride or something. But alcohol was involved when they were in a collision that killed them. And he landed in this place with other people that had died similarly. And it, it wasn't a punishing place, but it was not a pleasant place either. I've run across this several times where people are in one guy called it the DMV. <laughs> <laughs> Who would want to spend any more time there than they had to? But uh, but he he, he uh, was in this place, and he said, all of us who were here died in the collisions of cars and trains, and we're stuck here because there's this train track that runs right through the middle of it, but there's a big boulder on it. And I said, okay, well, let's work with that. Um, uh, well, he said, the first words he said, I remember now, were my, my sister was there, and this man's voice comes out of her and says, I'm not the conductor. I never told anybody I was the conductor. I'm not the conductor. And so I had to kind of say, well, hello, my name is Nathan. This is my sister Mimi. We're in her backyard in Houston, and we're so happy that you're here. But he didn't want to have any of it. He wanted to be, he wanted to have a brusque attitude. When I asked his name, he just said, call me buddy. Well, okay, buddy. Well, we're going to help you if you want to be helped. You don't have to talk with us if you don't want to. He was annoyed that, uh, that of all the people in this setting, that he was the one picked to do the talking. And he said, if you'd known me, I would have never been the one that volunteered to speak up and talk for a group. But for some reason today, I'm that. And I said, okay, well, let's just work with it. And he explained that they were all, none of them were moving. They couldn't because there was this train track, but there was a boulder on it. And I just said, well, what would, huh, what would, there have been boulders and train tracks for a long time. People must have figured out how to get a boulder off train track. What if you like did a fulcrum? What if you found some stick or plank or something and everybody leaned against it and he said it'd be a lot easier if i just had heavy equipment and i said well yeah you're right there i didn't think of that uh, i said have you asked for it and he said no and i said well um well why don't we do that why don't we ask god for heavy equipment and by the way why don't we ask for an operator that knows how to use it just in case it's something that you weren't familiar with would that be all right and he said yeah yeah that's all right so wait, I, I don't make a great big production of Christian prayer or Catholic prayers or anything. I just say, some, and sometimes I don't even say it out loud, but I'll just say, God, would you please send Buddy uh, a piece of heavy equipment and an operator that knows how to run the thing? And he said, be sure to ask for the keys. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, good idea, Buddy. It wouldn't do us any good if we can't start the dang thing. Uh, so we, I said, yeah, and please, please make sure the keys are in it. And uh, so uh, we just waited not 10 seconds. And he said, well, golly, look at that. And I said, well, I can't see what you're seeing. You're going to have to describe it. And he said, well, it's a piece of heavy equipment. And the guy inside the cab is motioning for me to come up. And I said, well, is it yellow? Lots of times they're yellow. He said, yeah, it's yellow. There's this, it's heavy equipment. There's a guy up in a cab and he's waving at me to come up. So I said, well, do you feel safe to do it? And he said, yeah. And so he climbed up in it. And he said, the guy is getting behind me the way that you might, you know, when somebody, you know, do you look over somebody's shoulder to, you know, just to supervise them a little. And he, and he said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to fire it up. And he started trying to move the boulder and he said, hang on a minute. It's turning into light. It turned from being a rock 
into a light. And he said, it's coming at us. And I said, in fact, I think I said, oh, shit, you, you all got you all got hit by something coming down a train track. <laughs> That's how you died. It, do you feel safe? He said, yeah, it's OK. It's just a ball of light and there's people inside of it. And then he said, look at that. It's my papa, his grandfather. And and I said, well, does he look scary? Do you think you're being tricked? No, it's my papa. And and he he's saying um, he wants me to get everybody that wants to to hold hands and he's going to pull us all through together. Wow. So um, so nobody had to move that day if they didn't want to. But there was an opportunity and it wasn't like it was their one and only chance either that they had an opportunity to move that day if they wanted to. So they were invited to hold hands. Uh, and I, I I remember writing about it. Did you ever play a game when you were a child that resembled that of being a, being on the lawn, um, you know, like Red Rover or something where yeah. you're all holding hands? We used yeah. to do something like that and pretend we were a train and always yeah. it was running off the rails and everybody was falling down and stuff. It was just little kids playing. Uh, but uh, he got them to hold hands and, and hang on to one another. And the um, the ball of light uh, and the piece of heavy equipment moved and they all uh, made their way out. And uh, in the end, I just said, well, buddy, it sounds like you're the conductor. You're, it's, you're pretty much saying all aboard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the train's leaving the station. And so in the end, a bunch of people crossed that day. So I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, that's a, a beautiful story. Okay, I just want one more story, and then I want to get to uh, your life and and the study that I did in 1970s. I have a couple couple questions to end with that, but okay. the one other story, my one of my assistants who was going to do this interview with me when I first originally thought about it, is now becoming an ambulance driver. She's training to be an ambulance driver. So can you tell me the story about the ambulance? What that that one just fascinated me. Yeah, that's Don and first responder Ralph. Uh, <laughs> in that story. I was uh, the dream. I was in the rear passenger seat of a car with three other people. Um, we were on a section of interstate in a southern city that was growing too fast for the roads to keep up. We were moving slowly on an interstate through a congested construction zone. When I looked ahead to my right and saw a pile of uh, construction materials that looked unsafe and a crane picking up a piece of it. And and then all at once, there was a cascade of uh, stuff falling onto the roadway. I got out of the car and tried to run and and was crushed. Or I wasn't I, I, I they very rarely show me gore. They they're kind to me. I'm asleep after all. So they're not making me wake up with screaming nightmares, but they show me danger. And then I wake up from it. Well, what happened to him? He he explained to me his name was Don. If I thought it might be Atlanta or Charlotte, I grew up near Houston and Houston's roads were like that all through my childhood. It was just the city was booming so much that the roads were having trouble keeping up. Uh, anyway, he said it was Savannah. And uh, he was so angry that somebody had been so incompetent as to put the traveling public at risk the way that they did. But somebody was somebody needed to be fired or whatever. He was angry. Uh, and he was especially grossed out because he, as he left his body, he wanted to see his face. And he did, and it was a bloody pulp. And he had uncommonly um, strong attention to his physical appearance. Uh, he he had his products and uh, never left the house without looking his best. And he had been at lunch on a business lunch and was on his way back to work with co-workers when his death occurred. Um, but we, as we talked to him more, we learned that he had, he remembered his prom or Valentine's dance in high school or something where you rented a tux and got all dressed up and stood in front of the mirror. Or your mom took pictures or whatever. Yeah. He remembered all of that, that he, that he really liked looking good and it made him feel great to look his best. And then he died a bloody mess. So he told us that in the afterlife, uh, part of what he wanted to do was uh, get over being a bloody, ugly mess. And so he had he was in something like a costume department where he could wear men's clothing from different periods when men wore ruffled collars or powdered wigs or, you know, pirate hats or whatever. He was he was enjoying looking different and seeing himself look 
uh, healthy again, but he still felt like he uh, he was primarily a bloody mess. And we wanted to help him cross because he's the one that came into our line. And he came up with the idea. He said, well, I, I, we, we asked him who he would like to come for him. He didn't want it to be anybody he knew because he didn't want anybody to see him look that way. And then uh, he came up with the idea, apparently on his own, well, there are people that are used to bloody messes. Aren't there people whose job it is to be in ambulances or emergency rooms or someplace where they're used to gory, bloody scenes? Maybe somebody like that. So I said, well, that's a good idea. We could ask. If we don't have to ask for a specific person. We can ask for whoever is the right one to come. And so when we asked, the person who showed up was somebody who hadn't crossed either. He was an ambulance driver from Omaha. Uh, who had died in a T-bone accident. Uh, he he said that um, that the person who rammed into his ambulance was wearing earbuds and listening to music and didn't hear the siren and rammed into him and killed him. Um, but we said, well, how would you, he said his name was Ralph. And we said, well, how would you know how to take him anywhere? You haven't even crossed yourself. And we said, how did you even know that we um, needed your help? And he said, my pager went off. <laughs> he was used to answering a page the way I was explaining earlier that it, there have been times in my life when I had to answer a page uh, anyway he we said well how would you know where to take him and as soon as we asked that question he said I don't know but an escalator just showed up and there's people <laughs> at the top of it saying come this way <laughs> said well I, I guess that must be the way then right so off they went the two of them went uh, from the plane they were on to a plane above them courtesy of an escalator and people at the top waving them to come up Absolutely. it's crazy uh, stuff uh, it uh, yeah. it's it's delightful I mean I, I as you know I have about 500 of these and yeah. the variety with which these things happen is just can be a lot of a lot of times it's just people going for a walk but sometimes it's really spectacularly creative yeah it, it almost reminds me of uh, I people sometimes say to me that I'm trying to turn things into a circus. And I said, well, I think it is kind of a circus. I think it's like, it's like Jesus. If, you know, Jesus hadn't walked on water and healed people, you never heard of the guy. I mean, what's the matter with circuses? They're kind of fun. Yeah, well, exactly. it's sort of like people sort of like it's dry, but that's the way I, I encourage people to read these books. And maybe you can tell me a little bit about the third book, the new book that's coming out, this eternity paused and, and what might be in that book. Because that's what I find is that it just these sort of like little short stories that enrapture you, but you're learning at the same time. It's, exactly, it's, and, and and that's the the thing. I think you have this very important mission that that just it's um it's not hard reading. It's just fascinating little stories that. But in the end, you realize like, oh, I learned something about how does the world actually work? Because I guess that's what it's all about: is where do we come from, where are we going, and and what's going on? Because most people, I think you would agree, really don't think about that until someone says you got like three months to live, and suddenly it's like panic city, and has anybody got cured of cancer, and and they start running around and trying to figure out what's going on. Or a tragedy happens in their life and, yeah. and a, a young, healthy person dies or you know, some unexpected death occurs. And, and then suddenly people who hardly ever give it a thought are now, you know, uh, broken hearted and, and can't get it off their mind. Well, anyway, the, uh, um, uh, the next book is it's in the works. Some of the people in the course of doing the crossing are very eloquent and good at describing their their circumstance immediately before they died as they died after the immediately after they died and and then the process that followed that all the way up to where we enter in sometimes they just do such a good job of explaining things that the next one is going to be afterlife interrupted please let me explain <laughs> i'm going to take stories where i think the protagonist did an exceptional job of explaining a circumstance that would benefit uh, the reader and I've done, I, as I wrote in Contact Modalities and in Inspired, I, I ran into a lot of people that, that basically said, I, I, they had a story and I said, did they tell you to write this book? And they go, yeah, they told me to write this book. And then I was like, this mission thing, are you on a mission? And it's like, well, I'm not sure, but I think so. And as this idea, did you have, how did you come with the books? Did you get help in writing the books? Did you get, well, of course you would have got through the stories, but did, how did the book thing start? Because a lot of people will describe that that's they came and said, well, you need to do a book. And the person said, I'm not I'm not doing your damn book. No, I'm not doing a book. And they, no, the time is right. You need to do this book. 
So did you have any sort of inspiration in the book or? Because well, I think, you know, the idea is that a lot of people read the book and, and they learn more from reading your one book than they've learned in their whole lifetime. And it's just, it's, 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 people don't realize the significance of this. Well, uh, the short answer is I was doing this work from about 1995 or so up till 2017 without going public with it, yeah. other than in a, a small circle of trusted friends and prayer partners. But uh, well, I write the dream down as, as soon as I receive it, as I did last night in a journal on the nightstand. I get with a prayer partner. We record the session on an app on my phone. As soon as we're done, all I have to do is hit send and it uh, gets transcribed and turned into a Word document. I spend time with the Word document just to clean up all of the run-on sentences, the incomplete sentences, the stammers. Um, it would be really annoying. I don't know if you've ever seen your own speech oh, yeah. transcribed. It's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> you, that, you that's to... where I, I actually use that as a, a way to tell, is the person in the field, are they actually getting material or are they making it up? And that's what I learned that is when you take people who do this kind of stuff and you actually transcribe what they're doing when they're actually doing it, not when they're interpreting, that there are no ands and buts, uh, stuff like that. And when you see your own speech, when you're trying to translate a YouTube uh, transla uh, translation or whatever, you see that and you realize yeah. like, Oh, they're, 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 you say eloquent. It's, it's like, there's no mistakes in their speech. They're not running on they're, they're this sort of stuff. And it's like, oh, they're, they're actually, it's not them talking. It's, it's something above them. That's, that's, um, you know, doesn't do that. I, that's what I noticed with that thing. And I can say, I can actually tell when somebody's in the field and getting this material because they don't do this weird stuff where they're stringing sentences together and, and hesitating and stuff like that. So maybe I'm at a lower level than field because uh, there's, I'm co-conscious with who's ever in me. I don't, I'm not entranced and they're using my vocabulary, my turn of a uh, phrase, my English language. They don't need to have spoken. They don't need to have learned English to use my voice and speak in English. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they do uh, have incomplete sentences and stammers and stuff. Uh, and I just, I spend a little time with the transcription just to clean those up without altering the, and I don't correct their grammar necessarily because no. sometimes uh, the way that people speak is just more authentic if you don't uh, yeah. mess with it too much. Uh, anyway, I do that. And and then, um, no, originally uh, I, I began, I was 60 years old or nearly so, and I'd been a campus minister at Arizona State, Stanford, UC Riverside and University of Arizona where I now live. And I just felt like telling these stories out loud while I was a pastor would have gotten in the way of my primary work at the time. Um, a lot of people find this stuff frightening or um, for whatever reason, uh, dangerous or, um, whatever so and and it's not just in the re, in religion when you hear people in the nde community talk about their ndes a lot of doctors lawyers uh professors don't speak of their ndes around their colleagues mm -hmm. or don't speak of it until they get to a certain point in their career where they feel like they're more or less untouchable uh, not while they're looking for tenure you don't necessarily want to talk about your <laughs> exactly. nde to the, to the tenure board well, anyway, I, I, I uh, even in, in a lot of clergy don't want to deal with this kind of stuff or think it's of the devil. And uh, so anyway, I'm I when I first started to write about it, I had a friend who was in the clergy. She's also an academician, Laura Dunham. She had written several books and uh, I kept talking to her and saying, one of these days I'm going to write a book. And she said, I don't know how many times I've heard that. When is this book going to get written? And. <laughs> Uh, I had moved away. I knew her in Riverside, and and uh, she, she followed me. She came over here about a seven-hour drive to Tucson and stayed in our guest house for a few days and said, let's get this thing outlined. And uh, so we sat at the kitchen. We had breakfast one morning, and she said, by noon, we'll have this outlined. I'll be over here doing this part. You go into your room and do that part. And by noon, we had the outline of the first book. And it's mostly the transcripts to begin with. It's just a little bit of, of explanatory material above at the front and the end. Uh, so that's how it got started. So I don't think it was really a, it wasn't like, it didn't feel like a supernatural download of any kind. It was a collaboration with a prayerful colleague who just said, let's get this thing done. There, but I, we, I did have to choose stories out of a, a large pool of potential stories. And in the first book, I was gonna go with a dozen I thought 12 is a nice biblical round number. 
And I had them all picked out. And this guy, Hal, just kept insisting. He just wouldn't go away, staying in my consciousness. And I just thought, I guess I'm supposed to include Hal. So it ended up with a 13th story. And then Hal ended up being a bridge between books one and book two. He had died in a, in a crash of a car. And one of the, do you remember the guy uh, that drove his grandmother's car off a pier? Oh, yeah. yeah. Paul was his name. Uh, he was stuck because he felt like he was wearing a scarlet letter. He Instead of an A, uh, he was minus four man because he had killed four people, including himself. Uh, and he was minus four man. And he became, uh, he was helped by his high school principal who had a, the, the friend who worked with him said, I think this is really an algebra problem. You're not minus four man. You're the only one that hasn't crossed. You haven't seen the other three since the accident. Sounds like they did just fine. <laughs> You're minus one man. Now we need to get you the other side of the equal sign. How do you get the negative one across the equal sign? Well, you add a positive one on both sides, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he said, uh, as soon as he said that, he said, let's be still for a moment. And then his high school principal, Mr. Wambacher, showed up with a football jersey from in the school colors with a number one on it. And he said, here, put this on. Now you'll be positive one. <laughs> And that's how he crossed. Well, anyway, it ended up that that uh, that Paul and and Hal end up being the bridge between books one and two. So there was a reason that Hal needed to be included. That I'm glad I listened to his insistence. Um, and now, and now God has opened up uh, Facebook Live for you and uh, YouTube and and things that are you got your own podcast. Maybe for a minute, talk about your podcast. And then I've got these four questions that I I want to ask you about. Um, for what I did in the 1970s, just quickly. All right. Well, just so you, I'm, I just turned 67 the other day. I got through all of my education on a typewriter. I'm the I'm the most unlikely guy <laughs> to be doing all this tech, uh, and I have lots of people to help me do it at different points. But you know, you do learn one step by step how to do stuff. Uh, so it, yeah, I have a podcast. I'm a Dominican, and Saint Dominic's nickname was the Joyful Friar. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I joined his order because of joy. I just thought joy is a really important thing. And I would like to be about a message of joy, even that the, the joyful message that death is survivable. What could be more important for mortals? So that podcast started last October. It includes some stories like this. Uh, I want it to include stories that are not yet in print. And I've been interviewing a bunch of people like Raymond Moody, Evan Alexander, and Karen Newell. Um, I've, they say yes. You, when you ask these really famous people in this field if they want to be on your podcast they say yes i i just didn't know it would be that easy but it is uh so that's fun and then that you know there's another book in the works and then i'm doing another one on the gospel of john as a play uh that one won't necessarily deal with afterlife stuff but it's creative and i, I like creativity it's important to me so you must do a lot of gratitude every day thanking god for the the opportunities you've gotten because I mean, you, you're playing you know, a role in, in terms of educating people. And, and that's, if you're a Dominican, that's probably what it's about, the, the preaching and getting the word out, right? Yes. And a lot of people find me through my website and bring me into their heart of hearts. You know, people with, um, yeah, they're struggling with the death of a loved one. I didn't write the books with the idea that they would be grief support books, but they do that function in some people's lives. Uh, there are a lot of people that have left organized religion for all kinds of reasons and find, uh, especially during the pandemic, we're using the internet as a place to search for yeah. information of a spiritual nature and have contacted me. And I've, so I've begun to have a network of people around the world. It's really cool. I never saw that coming. Um, and then and that's Nathan-Castle.com, correct? That's my website, Nathan-Castle.com. And if people want to contact me, that's where I want to be contacted. I don't, like Facebook Messenger or all those other places where, you know, on YouTube where you can make a comment or whatnot. If you really want me to reply, then send me an email through my website. I'm, I'm on it all the time. Beautiful. Okay, now let me give you these. In the 1970s, um, just after Raymond Moody first wrote the book, 
Um, I did a study, and this is when nobody knew about near-death experiences, and I went to the hospital, and I was intrigued by stories, like, almost like yours, like, uh, they're surround death, but they have messages, and, and what's this all about, and they're, they're kind of cool, all these stories about death, so I would go to the, the hospitals, and I wouldn't talk to the doctor, as you pointed out, doctors really don't want to get involved in this, uh, nurses, you know, they have reputations and stuff, and it's, you go to the guy like you, the guy that when the, the death is occurring, there's no more garbage. There's no games being played. It's like, okay, call the chaplain. So I would talk to all the chaplains. I went to all the different hospitals and I talked to the Salvation Army guy. I talked to the nun. I talked to uh, the, the Lutheran guy and I went around and I asked them all these questions and I, I about these different things. And so I'll ask you just, and just quick comment on these. I, I would say to them, you, you get that at the very end, you know, and, and you have these things in all your life of dealing with people around death. Have you ever seen miracles like people just get up and walk out of the hospital just at the very end? And have you seen this kind of stuff where you actually seen sort of people being prayed for and a, and a miracle occurs? What they told me was, yeah, but they always come back. They, there was something that they had to do or something that they that, that was very important and they, they sort of recovered, but they always ended up coming back and, and, and dying. I haven't seen anybody like get, go from, you know, deathbed to healthy. And, uh, but I've seen, I was with a 39 year old policeman who was dying of colon cancer. I had to help get him back into the hospital because uh, hospitals typically don't want you dying in them. That, you know, you, when you get yeah. to, uh, so far along, they want you in a nursing home or somewhere else. And his wife just couldn't take it. They had two little kids. Uh, and they were trying to do it in the living room, but I got the, got the nurse, I helped get him back in the hospital and he was in a coma uh, for several days and I was with him and his wife just left the room to get a cup of coffee or whatever. And, and as soon as she left the room, he bolted up uh, after being in a coma for several days and looked right past me to somebody else on the ceiling and said, no, not yet. I want to talk to my wife. <laughs> And I saw, so I, I got in his line of sight because he wasn't looking at me. And I pointed at the collar and said, I'm Father Nathan. I'm from the church. Your wife is out in the hall. I'll go get her. You stay right there. And so I went out and got her and I explained, I think he's so near the end now that someone has come for him, but he's refusing to go until he has a chance to say goodbye to you. Wow. So I said, you go back in the room. I'll leave the door open a crack. If you need me, call on me, but I'm going to give you privacy. And within five minutes, he was gone. So you see things like that that are extraordinary. They're not getting up and being healed of cancer, but uh, but it was a beautiful thing. Which goes to the idea that um, this idea that at the end of life, and you probably have some advice for people in terms of what's really important, because that's what you'll see is someone will say, I need my I need to say I'm sorry to my son or my daughter or my whatever. And they wait for this person to come. And as soon as the person comes, they, they say they're sorry and everything gets resolved and then they sort of just die with, almost right away. Yeah, so that a lot of that where people, and, and what, so what's the message to people? You get it all cleared up before, before the end in terms of you know, getting the, the people that, that, that have offended you out of the cave and, and, and resolve things? Because that's- as, be, as best you're able. Uh, I, I sometimes teach the difference between uh, forgiveness and reconciliation. I believe forgiveness can be done unilaterally Okay. Uh, Grant, you can forgive everybody that's yeah. ever wounded you by just choosing to. Yeah. Uh, you might have to choose it over and over again to get the job finished, but you can choose it. But to be reconciled means to be back in the circle with, and that means the other party wants to be in a relationship with you of some kind, and they might not want to. Uh, and sometimes I've dealt with people in the afterlife that, for example, were at the wheel of a car that caused the collision that killed other people. And they feel like they in the afterlife they want to find these people and apologize to them and very, very often the ones that i'm dealing with are told that's a noble thought hold that thought it's just not yet timely wow. uh, okay now you mentioned uh, my father two days before he died my father was you know kind of you like to play the skeptic and i remember him telling my mother he said uh two days before he died he said um my father was here today died in 1956. My mother said, oh, really? So what did he have to say? My father said, he was just here. That's all you need to know. And so do you see that a lot with this, yeah. where people um, are, are come across? So people can be encouraged that you will get help. People will come to you to help you over. They, almost the role you're doing of, of yes, taking you. Uh, there's all the kind time. of ways it operates. One thing I would say is, for, uh, for one thing, if you're a part of a vigil of somebody you love who is dying, don't make it all about you being there at the exact moment of their death. 
Okay. Um, because it's exhausting and people still need to sleep and shower and eat. Uh, it, it can be the moment you turn your back when the person dies. And we might, you and I might not have any uh, agency about the moment of our death. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. We don't, won't know until we're there. But sometimes people seem to pick the one moment when nobody was looking to slip out of the room. Yeah. It, it can be a pretty private thing and you don't know whether it's gonna be ugly and whether somebody is gonna watch a death rattle or some other yeah. uh, scene that you don't want them having to remember. So don't let, if you were not in the room at the time they died after doing a vigil, leave it alone, <laughs> just, just let it be. Uh, and then the other thing is that you can't necessarily tie life up in a bow. Just do your best. Say the things that you that you need to say, um, if they're appropriate and they're not and they're helpful. Uh, it's not good to take a dying person and remind them of, of the maltreatment they gave you as a child or whatnot. You don't need to load up. You, just be kind. Treat others the way you'd like to be treated. And trust that there'll be all eternity to work out whatever needs to be worked out. It doesn't all have to happen on clock time. It can happen later if it needs to. Beautiful. Now, as as, as a priest who probably gets called to, uh, late at night for these type of, of things, do you get do you get a lot of people telling you stories now because you're sort of in this field, near death experience stories, which really aren't your thing. But what we can tell uh, Nathan, he he'll he'll understand. You where everybody else, I've never told a story before, but um, they open up to you about. The, these these kind of events, especially like the near death experience stuff. Sometimes they do. The ones that I get, uh, Grant, are are not just near death experience, but I get people who also are contacted like I am, but they don't know what to do about it. That some there are people that just see ghosts or have yeah. co spirit contact of some kind with people that seem to need help, and they try to help them as best they're able. But when they hear of somebody like me, they want to compare notes and say, "What would you do with this?" Sometimes they don't know that they can set office hours. You know, if people are raising small children and they're at, they're cooking dinner and some ghost appears in the kitchen, you don't have to necessarily stop what you're doing. You can tell them not right now, but later. Uh, so I'll, I'll and I'll coach them a little bit about safe practices. And uh, you sometimes like I, I, I remember a guy saying it's it always happens when I'm in the car. You could say, well, that's like, you know, using a cell phone when you're in the car. When you're in the car, you need to be driving the car. You can tell people you're not allowed here in the car. Uh, so anyway, I, sometimes I'll help people figure out how to do what they're doing and and try not to take over. You know, I I try to teach people how to be receptive to their loved ones who have died. I don't do mediumship. I don't give bring messages back. Sometimes people want me to do that. I'll just say no, thank you. That, but I can I can coach you in how to be more receptive to messages that might come your way. And by the way. If your cousin or your aunt or your kid gets a message from the deceased, receive it as though it's given to you. And don't be jealous that, well, you, you talked to my sister, but not to me. Well, <laughs> what, uh, just receive what's given and don't be, uh, don't be jealous about it. Just be grateful. And the, the last question that I was, was asking these uh, chaplains uh, in the hospitals was the question, which I was kind of surprised some of them actually had a positive reply was, do you ever have people who predict they're going to die? Where they say, you know, get my wife here. Uh, and, um, you know, the, they get the wife and this is before the cell phone days where they had to find the, the wife and got her back in an hour. They said, you know, people have a real good day uh, near the end. And they said, there's nothing, you're doing good today. And an hour after he got his, they got his wife back. The guy was dead. Have you had, run into these kind of weird? I've I've people? heard those stories consistently over my career. Yeah, that 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 can that often can happen. Yeah, and it's, then sometimes not. You know, sometimes yeah, yeah. they do die before. I my dad died a half an hour before I got there, but I I uh, had already said everything there was to be said. It wasn't like there was some um, big looming thing between us. We had done what we needed to do. So. These, okay, so for all of these stories, they, they, they're, they're, yeah. there's a genre of these stories, but then there are yeah. always stories that that land outside the lines too. Yeah, I, I was just fascinated with that stuff, and and now I'm I I see it as critically important to listen to people like you who sort of are on getting material and sort of filling in the holes of of what was formerly rumor and, and speculation. So I, I appreciate your your you're doing what you're doing. You still you do mass every day, and you're in where. 
Yeah. I live in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, you're in uh, Tucson. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm ever there, ever there, I will definitely stop by and and want to uh, share mass if you're doing mass there because I I'm just um, I go there fairly often into the Phoenix area. But um, and and let's go through your your books now and just relate to people again where they can get a hold of you and. Um, you can see the cover of my first book is on the wall behind me, that product placement, you know. <laughs> there right you there. go, okay, yeah. Uh, Toto and Toto to the Wizard of Oz is a spiritual adventure. That was my first book. Um, it involves the NDE of Dorothy Gale. She gets hit in the head by flying debris. She goes into a different consciousness. She eventually emerges out of it and uh, has all these adventures and comes full circle. So that's my first book. And then Afterlife uh, book one, I call it Helping Stuck Souls Crossover. And then the second in that series is Afterlife Interrupted book two, Helping Souls Crossover. We got rid of the word stuck because we saw that they weren't all so much stuck as they just needed extra care because of the uh, trauma uh, that they endured leaving their body. And then the, the next two are going to be a third Afterlife Interrupted book, the uh, please uh, uh, let me explain. And then I'm doing one on the Gospel of John possibly having been written as a script of a play. I'm crowdsourcing that one on Zoom. I'm looking for people to help, help me imagine if you were going to bring this scene to life on a stage, how would you do it? Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Case, I want to uh, thank you. And you're the joyful friar. So uh, you deal with life uh, and the what it's all about. So have you got a joyful message that would sort of sum up your view of of what life is all about. If someone's, you know, because you'll have people that are maybe on the Facebook today who really still don't know and they they, they have doubts. So what would be your message to the world in terms of uh, what's important and and a, and a joyful end of thing? It's almost like the one I always use is, is John Lennon says, and I think you mentioned this, uh, everything will be okay in the end. If it's not the, If it's not okay, it's not the end. I do believe in the cosmic happy ending, that all of us will have a happy ending. It might not be at the moment of our physical death, but there's still more life to be lived after that. Uh, when people ask me how I'm doing, if you run into me in the hall and say, hey, Nathan, how are you doing? I'll say, I've never been better because <laughs> I believe it's always true, or at least I want it to be. Um, even if I'm having, if I'm ill or whatever, I'm, I do believe that Life gets better and better and better. And even if you're having a bad day, you can live in joyful hope that this will resolve. All will be well. Uh, I don't think that's Pollyanna-ish. I think it's just a universal truth that things get better and better and better. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing with me. It was an honor to talk to you. And I will do whatever I can to get your message out and your books doing because that. it is extremely important. You're one of the three or four that I talk about consistently uh that sort of moved me you you go through life and you you run into different i've seen a lot of weird stuff and a lot of weird theories and stuff like that but from time to time it hits you and it's almost like it's almost like you get shown um the analogy would be where someone shows it to you and you go oh yeah i remember and that's when when your stuff is like that it's like oh yeah it's like that makes sense it's it comes with this absolute sort of certainty like this this is real what this guy's talking about it's, it's not just a theory it's it's uh, so I, I appreciate you what you do for the world and whatever I can do to help you along I, I will do what I can and uh, I really appreciate your spending time with me and I'm um, looking forward to your your new book because um, I, I love the stories that that are told by the people that you're dealing with sure if we if you happen to I don't know if you ever go to Ions events but the national convention is over yeah. Labor Day in uh, Arlington Virginia uh, DC and I'll be speaking at that. So oh. if you happen to be there, we could hang out if you want. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, wonderful. So I, I guess you mentioned this, that, that that's when you look up to, to people that you were motivated by their writings or their story, like Eben Alexander, who I've interviewed and stuff like that. When you yeah. meet them, you go like, wow, I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's you almost like I always describe to people that you, people don't realize when you realize what you and I have been given in terms of information and stuff that we live in the Super Bowl every single day. Some people yeah. will spend two hours watching it. We get to live it every single day. If, if you really realize what's going on, Absolutely. how significant it is, what we're doing and and how we have an opportunity to change the world. And and so I appreciate what you're doing. All right. Well, Beautiful. thanks for having me on your show. Beautiful. Thank you. Bye. Talk to you later. Uh -huh.